Hi guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Alright, thanks for joining me today. For those of you that don't know me, I am Judy Cho. I am a nutritional therapy practitioner and I work with my clients to get to root cause healing. And I try to share videos on my channel to help you to find your own root cause healing as well. All right, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to subscribe, hit the bell, like this video. This allows me to provide you more free content. I have with me Rob Carvel. He was one of the top three winners of the Carnivore 75 Hard Challenge. Um, I cannot wait for you to hear his journey and just what he has still doing Carnivore 75 hard and just continuing Carnivore 75 hard. So Rob, thanks for joining me. If you can just, you know, share your story. You're welcome. Hi, it's good to, good to talk to you again. <laughs> so my story pretty much started out with kind of stumbling into the whole challenge because I had, like I saw people talking about it on social media. I was kind of more involved in, I want to say paleo, low carb type stuff, not necessarily carnivore. And a number of people had been mentioning to it, mentioning this challenge, probably maybe a week or two leading up to it. And I kind of looked at it and I was vaguely kind of familiar with carnivore. I'd seen some people discussing it before, although it more tended to be people that were doing kind of like raw carnivore and stuff like that. So my first impression of it was kind of like of a more extreme perspective rather than the more kind of moderate perspective that other people right. do. Right. But I looked at it and I was like, this sounds like something that would be interesting to challenge myself with as well as not like keep from going off on some sort of like carb and sweet bender during the holidays because you just have three that just come right up on you there with Halloween, Thanksgiving and Christmas all kind of one right after the other. <clears throat> and every year it seemed like that was always a bad time for trying to do pretty much any kind of diet plan. And it seemed like this was a good way to challenge yourself by just, you know, going right into the teeth of one of the hardest parts of the year to get through on a focus like that. And also I liked the idea, that I also liked the appeal of the fact that, you know, you weren't supposed to have any cheats. There was no cheat meals or anything like that, that it was a very kind of, it was a very kind of locked in focus on this one goal. and all of that together, you know, gave me something that was, I thought would challenge me. It was something that I really looked forward to trying to do. And so I kind of sat there, waffled about it back and forth. And finally, like, I think like 12 hours before the deadline, I kind of came and said, okay, I'm going to do this. Um, and everybody was very nice about it. It wasn't like, who are you, you interloper coming into this? Because, you know, I, like nobody knew who I was at that point. And, um, but it was, it was very nice how everybody kind of, the, the community around doing this coalesced very quickly and everybody was very supportive of everybody else, including, you know, if somebody had a slip up, everybody was like, all right, just pick yourself up and let's, let's go again. It wasn't one of these things where it's like, okay, now you're banished into the outer darkness for all eternity because you made a mistake. Right, right. So what were some of the benefits that you experienced? Um, you know, if you were paleo before, like what were some of the things that you struggled with that then you benefited from, um, you know, starting, I guess, Carnivore 75 hard? The biggest thing, the biggest problem that I always had was this attitude that because I'd done something right for, you know, fill in the blank period of time, that somehow meant that I earned the ability to do like a cheat meal. And it never just stopped at that. It never did. Um, it, you know, it's, it's one of those questions of how many times do you have to touch the hot stove before you learn that this, that it's going to hurt. Um, and I was still learning at that point, but the fact that I was, you know, committed to a program that basically said, no, you need to stay on the straight and narrow and do this. and that combined with the fact that I really didn't want to have to come into the group and tell everybody that I'd messed up was a good motivator when the temptation arose. Right. So that was probably the biggest thing was just the fact that, that you know, on this protocol, there is no, Hey, you've been good. Now is time to kind of slack off. It's like, you got to be fully locked in for 75 <laughs> days, do all the, do everything to the letter. And that was very appealing, appealing to me because it gave me kind of a structure to follow. Um, for those of you that are watching, but, um, you know, I adopted this or adapted this from Andy Frisella, 75 hard. And I mean, his, he would, you know, cry if he saw that I changed some of the components of his, but, you know, it's because, you know, we picked 75 days because habits supposedly take two weeks to maybe 66 days. And 
I mean, 75 days of doing the same thing daily it almost ensures that, you know, you'll be able to make these habits new, right? So whether it's eating carnivore or, you know, doing um, light intermittent fasting or, you know, moving outside. Um, and so for you, um, what is, you know, been the biggest benefit? Because I know, like, what day are you on now? <laughs> Um, actually, today it's going to be seven months since I started because we started oh. October 18th and today is May 18th. So that's been about, oh, that's it's been awesome. about seven months. I didn't even realize that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just realized that this morning when I was filling out one of my little, like I treat my Instagram account almost like a kind of like a, like a personal journal in a way that every, that I'm helping kind of track what I'm doing. Right. Um, and I mean, and the thing is, I get, I get a lot of good feedback from people on there about all the different kinds of stuff that I'm doing. So that's, that's kind of cool. And I'm glad that other people find it interesting, but the, um, yeah, the 75 days thing, cause one of the things that I did because you recommended it and all was, was actually go and listen to his explanation of this whole program. And it was something that it was very obvious. He put a lot of thought into and the 75 days was not just some arbitrary value. It was actually something that I think was, was, he came to that via a lot of reflection and a lot of personal experience. Um, probably the biggest example that, that I can think of how it affected me was, and this is, this is very amusing, that the one thing that I really wanted to cheat bad on was I, I really liked those, um, I don't know, like the, the monster drinks that come in the white cans. I really liked those. And that was the thing that was like, oh man, when this is all over, that's the first thing I'm going to have. But by the time we got to 75 days, um, you know, when the, when the bridge came along, I was like, okay, I want to push forward and really, you know, stay locked in and do that. And once that hundred days was gone, I really didn't want those things anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really seemed, I mean, and, and I know it seems silly that the thing that I would want to cheat on is like a non, non calorie energy drink, but I think it's, that's also kind of a testament to the psychological hold that mm -hmm. just the taste of sweet in general can hold over people, um, myself Absolutely. included. Right. And, so that's, I mean, and that's kind of the reason why I'm glad that it, that it wasn't just like a removal of sugar, it was a removal of all sweet stuff. Because I think in my own experience, keeping those things in there made it easier to kind of fall back into old habits because you were still kind of uh, feeding that desire for sweet psychologically, I guess. But the, but yeah, the 75 days thing, that really, by the time that was over, I was so locked into those habits that really almost became effortless not to do that. And also, I mean, it also helps that I was feeling really good. I'd lost a lot of weight. My, um, had more energy, lots of different stuff. Um, and just, you know, overall feeling better, could go and exercise and do stuff. And if I, you know, really wore myself down, recovery time wasn't very long. One thing I can think in particular that stood out was when I went to go put up Christmas lights for the first time ever, I wasn't like in ha having like massive leg muscle soreness for days on afterwards from climbing up and down ladders. So that was a, that was one thing that I did notice too, was that recovery and also just kind of just the way that my muscles handles, you know, getting used in that sort of way was a lot, was improved that, a lot. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I mean, you know, I follow your, all your Instagram um, posts and then I think you're on the Facebook group as well, but you know, you're so consistent. So every day you post about your movement your outdoor walks, um, your meals, and then your gratitudes. Um, maybe not as much lately with the gratitudes, but in general, you know, you post a lot and that really provides you accountability, but it also inspires right. others. And it's really amazing. And I mean, I saw every single day for 75 days and then the bridge of another 25. And then now like seven months in, I mean, you're, you're so consistent. And I think that's why you have seen so much healing um, through this whole Carnivore 75 Hard Community Challenge. Um, so how much weight did you lose? Um, so far, like, like I haven't weighed myself in a couple of days, but I was up to 76 pounds, I believe. At the oh, last wow. time I weighed myself, I, st I started out at 323, and last time I weighed myself, I was at 244. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things, like, like going back to what you said before, the one of the things about this kind of structure is, I've found that like people who, who function better in a structured life, a lot of times are good at making their own structure. Well, I'm not one of those people. I'm terrible at it. So if somebody can give me a structure and I can get locked into it, that's just generally better for me. Um, because without the structure, a lot of times it just kind of descends into this state of just like vague sort of existence that um, not a lot really happens. And, <clears throat> and so the, uh, 
And so, yeah, this, the, I mean, and that's part of the reason why I'm so committed to following the structure because it works really well on kind of keeping my life organized. And that's, oh, that's so important right now, especially with a lot of the things that I relied on to kind of keep order, such as, you know, going to work, doing different activities and stuff like that. All of that is stopped and we're all kind of stuck at home. And so yeah. having that structure has been very helpful on a, on a, not, not just, you know, for health and everything else, but also find kind of for mental wellness as well. Right. Right. And, and this challenge is not just a physical challenge. It's the, I mean, it's a mental fitness challenge, right? So, right. I mean, you, you experienced it. Like there's days that it was really cold during the winter and then there's days that it's hot and no matter what, no matter what happened, no matter how tired, no matter how exhausted you had to go outside and do 15 minutes of something. And there were days right. that it was like low thirties. And I know that's probably not cold for some people, but I mean, it was cold in Austin. I remember there were some days. Um, and so, yes, um, you know, it just provides, like you said, that consistency that um, it's the daily wins. And then, you know, I know you also got the Apple watch and then you started closing your rings and my husband. Right. does. So whenever you share, sometimes I share with Kevin and, you know, he met yeah. you in person and he's, mm -hmm. so, you know, he's always like, Oh, I'm so proud of Rob. I can't wait to see him again. And like, look, yeah. he closes all his circles too. So those are things that, you know, it's like these small successes, you know, they beget more successes. They're the ones, they're the things that keep you motivated and to, you know, give you structure, like you said, and to keep you going. And who would have thought, you know, imagine if I told you like the few days before you're like, fine, I'll just try this carnivore 75 hard. That's seven months out that you would still be doing it day in and day out. And there's very few people that are still doing it even this far out. And so it's, right. it's amazing and it's powerful. So, um, you know, like one thing I wanted to ask you is, so I know you sure. recently had a child and, or are you, is not, he's not born yet, right? Uh, the, no, there, we, I have a son that's three and then another right. one that's due in September. Okay. I'm, I'm curious to see how your energy levels will be with the newborn now um, with, you know, this new found kind of energy and structure and then yeah. like how it was um, maybe three years ago. That'd be a really interesting kind of, you know, just like how you experienced um, putting up lights during Christmas, like how different is it going to be for you um, with this new baby and congratulations again. Thank you. Well, it's certainly easier to keep up with a three-year-old now than it used to be. I mean, and this is a child who, who we have a little like interior trampoline for him and he'll sit there and jump, 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 oh. jump, jump for 45 straight minutes. And you oh, wonder wow. where he's, he's finding the energy to do that. But um, I mean, one of the things too, I've noticed is that, you know, like I mentioned back before uh, that um, the sweet sleep quality has gone up and that's very and that's a big factor too, because, you know, if I get woken up, I mean, the, the problem is it's kind of a double edged sword because I need to sleep more, but I, but I don't like get run down as easily if I don't sleep as much. And so it's one of those things where it's like, I got to make myself. And, I, and that's one, that's one of the reasons why, like I started posting on my Instagram, how much sleep I'm getting so that people can bust my chops. If I go for like three straight days where I'm only sleeping five hours. Um, I don't know if anybody will do that, but if they want to, that's fine. I'll take it. That's why I'm posting it there. I'll do but that. The, you okay. and I are both up at really late night. So I totally get it. <laughs> yeah. Like, and the thing is, I, I'm not necessarily fully locked in as like a night owl. Like if I do certain, if I do certain things with my schedule, like if I get up, I exercise and do things like that, I can turn myself into a morning person, but it's, it's just like, I think just because of so much of my life, I would do stuff at night. It kind of got me locked in into that kind of mindset. Right. But the problem is, you know, the, the, the you know, morning people run the world. And so I'm kind of at their mercy in terms of, <laughs> how, I, how I have to conduct things. Right. So what would you say is, um, you know, of the five components, what would you say was your favorite or um, maybe that I guess affected you or positively influenced your life the most, if there is even one? I would say the gratitude, the mindset, because mm -hmm. I realized after a few weeks that I'd always had been thinking about this stuff, but I'd never been necessarily fully aware of it. I mean, cause you can have stuff going around in your head that maybe you're consciously not aware of, but I found that when I was trying to sit down and write down these things, it really made me realize that I was thinking about it more than I, than I thought. Um, and I mean, and, and community probably tied into the same thing as well, because it forced me to be a little more focused on, you know, what I was doing for the day and being more intentional. Right. And that's certain. And, and I mean, one of the things I realized is I'm a lot nicer than I thought I was, which is kind of nice. Um, but I mean, I think it's important, I mean, especially now too, because everybody's separated to, 
be thankful for what you can do. Yes. You know, and I'm very thankful for, you know, I've, I've you know, been able to stick to what I'm doing despite, you know, sometimes it being a little more complicated to get the things that I need. Um, you know, I'm very thankful for the people still working hard so that all that can happen. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been fortunate that I'm able to work from home is the nature of the work that I do, but not everybody's that blessed. Um, and so, I mean, it was things like that that I think kind of put more, more meaning behind what was going on from day to day. Um, in terms, I mean, and, and I mean, and the thing is, it wasn't necessarily like hard to do those things, but it was one of those things where I had, it was kind of like having to, kind of, kind of having to like exercise a muscle I'd never used before sure. in a way. And so now that you've been doing it for a while, does it just kind of come naturally to you? Yeah, I guess, I mean, I mean, the, I mean, like I was just able to just speaking off the cuff, say those things now, but I, before I would have probably been like, um, uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm happy for, you know, this, that sort of thing. So it is definitely something I'm thinking about more. Uh, I think it, I think it certainly helps with gratitude. Sure. Um, you take less stuff for granted. Yes. No, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, the more, you know, mindset is everything. And the more we try to find the good in our lives, even on days that are hard, it helps us change perspective and then act accordingly. And so that's why the gratitude component is in the challenge. Um, so, you know, when you started Carnivore 75 Hard and now just eating Carnivore for seven months, has your diet changed at all? What are you eating? Are you still um, doing the intermittent fasting? Are you fasting more? Yeah, I, I mean, I still do. I, tr I still try to do it minimum 16 hours. I've, I've been consistent in that. I, I've at minimum fasted 16 hours the whole time. I think the longest I've gone was almost two days. Um, for the most part, it's usually in between 16 to 24 hours. I don't really try to do the long fasts. Um, some, something maybe to consider at some, at some point. But right now, I kind of like, like the rhythm of how this is going. But the, I mean, the, and the thing is, the fasting thing was the thing that sc that actually scared me a lot. But I found, I found that that was actually probably the the thing that had, I had the most unfounded concern about. Um, I mean, one mistake that, and I in, have admitted this on numerous occasions. One mistake I made was probably going a little bit overboard and and making myself ill from from not eating enough, which is why I'm you know trying to be more aware of making sure I eat enough each day and and things like that. Because I think it was the first weekend after this started, I ended up getting like chills and shakes and stuff like that because I hadn't eaten enough. Um, so was kind of out of commission for a day, but bounced back pretty quickly just because, you know, just as long as I, you know, ate and rested a little bit and that kind of fixed itself. So that's why I'm always like, don't over fast. Make sure you eat enough because it feels like you have the flu for 24 hours and it's terrible. Yes. Yeah, that's a blend of um, like el electrolyte imbalance, but it, it can also be a hypoglycemic episode. So if you're used to, you know, the sh um, sugars not being kind of balanced and then not having that food. Um, but in general for men, you can, um, the studies show that weight loss is, you know, the equivalent of a woman fasting for 36 hours for a man, it would be like 18. So really there's no need for you to do extended fasts. I mean, you could do it for 18 every day and be, um, realizing weight loss. So, you know, I always yeah. say if it's not broken, don't fix it. Um, so that's good. I mean, so what about food? Um, you know, what, how did you kind of start in the beginning? Did you ever track? And then like, what are you kind of eating now? Uh, I was never into tracking, like, so I never did, like, macro tracking or anything like that. I mean, I'm a really analytical person, so if I started doing macros, that would, that would very quickly, like, descend to the dark side and just be, like, really bad. So I think it's better, I think it was better for me just to kind of self-regulate, like, go with the self-kind of regulating principle, and that actually works really well, and I've heard other people that have, you know, maybe switched from, like, keto or something to, to carnivore saying that it is a lot easier to self-regulate on there. It's really hard to overeat meat. I mean, you got to be really committed to do that. Um, and yeah. so that, that helps. But I, like, and I've kind of bounced around between different stuff. I think when I started out, I did a lot of, a lot of chicken and then kind of shifted to beef and then to pork and then back to beef again. So um, one of the things that I've been trying to do lately is just kind of mix things up a little bit because a lot of times I get into this thing where I'm just like, same thing for breakfast, same thing for lunch, which is fine for me, but I, I feel like maybe it's important to change it up. One of the things that I've been doing lately is trying to do some some like seafood and fish like uh, a few days ago did tuna today did some mahi mahi which came out really well mm -hmm. and I mean for some people obviously because of autoimmune they're going to be kind of more limited on what they can do but since as far as I'm aware I don't have any autoimmune disorders I am just trying to do you know do some variety 
And, but most of the things that I do tend to be, with the exception of fish, tend to be more kind of fattier cuts. Like I don't eat necessarily eat chicken breasts. I'll do chicken thighs instead. Um, and try all kinds of different stuff like grilling, frying, baking, uh, sauteing, things like that. Yeah, I'm just trying to be creative and try different cooking things. I mean, because I've cooked a lot. Uh, you know, I, I know how to cook. And so I'm just trying to trying to kind of, you know, use all the different skills that I have in the toolbox. So what about fat? Do you add like butter? Do you add any extra fat to your meals? Yeah. Um, if Depending on like, because I've kind of ping pong back and forth between do I want to include dairy? Do I not want to include dairy? I've done kind of stretches of both. Right now I do a little bit of dairy, mostly as like a topping. So it's not like if you look at my plate, am I going to have a big chunk of cheese on the side? It's going to be usually like a little shredded cheese in a, in a scrambled egg or something like that. Um, so that's one kind of fat source, and that's a pretty easy fat source to get. The I tend to either cook with butter or ghee. I also will keep um, – and th- th- it, when I do, when I roast pork belly, you get a lot of drippings from that. And that's really good to cook with because um, it actually tastes like bacon. And it's also got some, you know, because you salt it when you're roasting, it, it's kind of a salty kind of bacon flavor that comes off of that. And pretty much anything you cook and that's going to be good. No, that's right. That's true. And I agree with you with the macros. I mean, I think if you start a new diet, it's a good way to kind of see that you're eating enough. But in general, you know, one of the beauties of carnivore is just trusting your body and then eat until you're full. Um, right. And, you know, and if, as long as you're not eating too many processed foods like cheese and jerkies, it's not, you know, you won't gain a ton of weight. Um, but it's when you add like these, you know, you snack or eat when you're not really hungry, but you're just eating because you're bored or stressed. So like, um, you know, emotional eating, but otherwise right. you could just trust your body and then eat, um, you know, as needed as I remove like jerkies and cheese, like I've noticed I've like lost a few pounds and I'm not tracking. Right. So it's, yeah. So I agree with you. Um, so what about your wife? Um, does she eat more meat now? Like what does she say with all these changes? Um, she's pretty happy. I mean, because you know, I, I've improved my health so much and, um, and also just like, especially getting the, the, the blood pressure issue sorted out because I did get hospitalized for that at one point. Um, but like my wife doesn't do carnivore. She's kind of more, I would say moderate carb diet. My son's kind of the same way. Although I think he would very willingly go carnivore given the opportunity. Cause he's very, he very much likes meat. Okay. Um, in fact, like if I'm cooking something, he's kind of like looking over trying to see what it is that I'm making. And like, one of the things that I've been doing is I've been doing some like, um, canned corned beef as a breakfast okay. meat. And every time I start cooking that, he starts asking for some of it. Because I, I give him some to taste, and I think I might have created a monster because he's always asking for more of it. And he's got a very serious appetite because he needs, he needs to fuel that furnace for jumping for 45 straight minutes. <laughs> That's good. He's at the age right now where the brain is growing. I mean, it's pretty much 90% grown by the age of five. So, yes, feed mm-hmm. him all the good fats. Feed <laughs> him a lot of meats. He definitely needs it. And, yes, I know how – I have a three-year-old too, and I know how much energy they have. Um, do you plan on doing carnivore forever? Do you think that, you know, once you get to a weight that you're like, okay, yeah, I'm at a good weight now. And you know, all your health markers are good. Um, do you see yourself doing it long term? Like, what are your plans with carnivore and your diet? The thing is, I don't like for me, I'm afraid to get into the mindset of I'm cured. Now I can go do, you know, fill in the blank thing. Right. Um, because I really don't know how that would work. And for, I mean, for right now, like, and the other thing is too, is I'm not really sure, you know, what I'm supposed to weigh. Cause I've been probably overweight since early teens. I mean, and, and you can't really go by, for example, like what the BMI chart says, because what the BMI chart says I'm supposed to weigh is completely insane. Um, and so I don't see any reason to stop doing this. It's certainly something that's doable and you know, and, 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 and I do get asked, I get a lot, oh, so that means you're never going to have cake again, you know, things like that. And what bothers me about that is I don't like, like, I don't like when people ask me that because it's sort of like asking somebody who's like, you know, so are you never going to have heroin again? Yeah. I mean, because, because, you know, if, if something's going to, if something like that's going to lead to destructive behavior, that's, well, that's one thing. And I don't know if, I don't know if it's going to be that case for me or not. But I think I'm pretty happy to hold serve right now. I mean, I think maybe at minimum, maybe go back to say maybe paleo. But I mean, because for me, the biggest, the biggest thing that I've learned is that I, you know, at this point in my life, just do not have the mental discipline to do a cheat meal. And I think one of the biggest things that I, that I got out of being, you know, forced to for 75 days to not do that is the fact that I learned that that was my biggest downfall was the fact that I would, 
you know, delude myself into thinking, oh, I've earned a cheat because I've done, you know, I've behaved myself for a month. I, I totally understand. I'm the same way. So I, I'll like have some nuts and I'm like, oh, well, nuts is still kind of healthy or I'll do, you know, some, something else that's, you know, moderate. It's still like keto or paleo. And then it's a slippery slope. So I completely understand. Um, you know, my husband sees like Kevin sees how much my mental health has, um, you know, gotten better from carnivore. And so, you know, at first he was like, I don't know if you're just going to be able to eat meat for the rest of your life. But now he sees the healing powers of it. And he's like, fine, if you want to eat meat just for the rest of your life, like I support you. And why, you know, change something if it's you're thriving off it. And sure, I mean, it'd be nice to be flexible. But if you know yourself, like you're saying you do, um, and if you're more of an abstainer than a moderator, then it makes sense why you're like, yeah, I don't know if I want to even dabble in it because you have such a strong streak right now. Seven months of Carnivore 75 Heart is amazing. Like I haven't even done that, right? So go for as long as you can because there's no negative. I mean, you're not, I promise you the one, like I went carnivore for many, many months. And then I tried um, during the holidays, like last, last year, I had some keto treats and then it ended up becoming real sugar after, after a while. Right. Uh, it tastes so processed and you'll know it the first time you try it, but, but then it starts having you have those sugar cravings, but it doesn't taste like real food. At least it didn't for me. Um, and so it's like maybe the memories or the emotional nostalgia that you, maybe you'll miss it. But when you actually have it, it'll never be worth that feeling. Um, and yeah. And the, I mean, and the thing is too, is that you have, you know, like, you know, uh, you know, family members have certain kind of specialties that they make and, and they're kind of like, Oh, you don't want to try this this time. And, you know, that sort of stuff that, I mean, cause there's a lot of pressure. If somebody has like a specialty that, you know, you can't indulge in it or it's like, but you always ate this growing up. Why don't you want it now? That sort of stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, I think all the success that I've had has given me a little more credibility to kind of push back against that sort of stuff in the, in, in the, in, when, you know, family peer pressure comes along. So that's, that's been a blessing because I mean, suffice to say, I didn't have a lot of credibility in the area of weight loss because I, you know, I, I'd been on and off the wagon so much. They built me my per, a personal escalator of it. So that was kind of, I mean, so now that I've actually succeeded in something that's, you know, bought me, you know, some credibility when I'm saying, look, I need to do this. This is important for people to say, okay, that's fine. The, um, yeah. And the other thing too, is that I think one of the things I've noticed too, is just going this long without eating anything sweet. It really gets you tuned up and sensitive to it. Um, things like if you, if you, if I get like a piece of brisket that somebody's put just like a little bit of brown yes. sugar in the rub, it's like getting slapped across the face. It is so sweet. I think like the last time I got a cold, I, without thinking through a cop cough drop in my mouth and gagged because it was so sweet. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, it's just stuff like that. I mean, and, and the thing that's really scary is that that's one of those things that you become like, you develop sort of a tolerance to it. And you go from being able to, I mean, like slamming down a Pepsi and not even thinking about it to where I don't like, I don't even know if I could have like a teaspoon of it without it making me feel sick because it would just taste so sweet. That's amazing. I'm so proud of you. And I met you in person. So I just feel like that extra affinity towards you. So, you know, and you know, I talk with Mary and we want to, once this whole, you know, COVID is over, um, we want to do another meetup in person, Okay. you know, the barbecue and it'll be fun. Um, You know, do you, so what do you think? Like, do you think that this, you know, carnivore, not necessarily even carnivore 75 hard, but do you think carnivore is for everyone? I mean, do you think everyone should kind of try it? Or do you think like, who do you think are the people that would benefit from this? I think, I think, well, I think, I think anybody could do it, but the, but the, the why has got to be there because I don't think, I don't, I, I think unless you have, have, I think you necessarily have, need to have your why at the start. You can figure it out as you go along, but you need to figure something out at some point. I think people need to do what works for them. This worked for me. Now, obviously, one exception is like, you know, if you have like severe autoimmune, this may be something that you need to do. Yes. But um, I think someone, I think people need to find what works for them. And, and the thing is, I think one of the things that I really like about carnivore, the community itself, is if somebody's like, hey, I don't think this is working for me. I think I need to maybe incorporate, because I've seen a few people in carnivore who have, you know, incorporated a little bit of fruit into the diet because they need a little more, a little more carbohydrate. And everybody's been like, okay, just do what works for you rather than, you know, going around and, and looking for 
pitchforks and torches to grab to go after the individual. I think most carnivores are very open and I think our community is so good. Um, you know, there's a few that are dogmatic, but in general, you know, we're open and we want at the end of the day, you know, we're having a diet that's kind of fringe that's focused just eating meat. And, and so when other people just want to heal, we're supportive, right? Because something happened in our lives that we're willing to just eat meat and then we fall in love with it. But if sometimes it doesn't work for someone, we are also as a community open that, hey, find your journey and find what works for you because we're all in this to find optimal health, right? It's not some dogma. I definitely like to see there, there being so, so much support because I mean, I think the idea is that everybody needs to find what works for them and let's, and let's help these people on the journey to finding that answer. Yes. Because, the, you know, I've interacted with so many people that have, have succeeded in a whole different, different number of ways that it would be very hypocritical for me to come out and say, my way is the only way. I'm, I, I get a little bit concerned about, especially in diet, is this, what I've jokingly referred to as guruism, which is where people want to find one person where they can just like, you know, shut all their discernment skills off and just, you know, listen to what they're doing. But I think people need to remember that you're the best expert on yourself. You're your own N equals one experiment. You need to do what works for you. And so if you're doing something and somebody comes out and says, well, I, you know, believe that that's not going to work. Don't like go into a nosedive because, because of that. Just remember, Hey, my experience has told me this and I'm going to stick with, with, you know, what's work, what works for me. Yes. I, yes, hundred percent agree with you. Um, I always tell like some of my clients will bring up like some influencers and I'm saying, the only difference between you and that other person that's an influencer are maybe they have a few more followers than you, but in general, their opinion is their own story and your story is your you know own story too. And you have to go with what works for you. You can try some of the recommendations they're saying, but that doesn't mean that their answer is the answer. No one knows your body as much as you because you're the one that's experiencing everything in your body. And so you are absolutely right. Don't trust anyone. Don't even trust me. I may give recommendations, but it might not fit for you, right? Um, and so you have to figure out what works for you in order to find your optimal health. And it's different for everybody. And so never, never just listen to someone saying you should do this and this, and then therefore you will have optimal health. If someone had that answer that fit everybody, they would be a gazillionaire. And that is why we have so many diets, so many supplements, so many medications, because there is no one size fits all for anyone. Meat does not heal everything. It heals a lot, right? right. So I just think that's where I, I so appreciate you saying this because it's so true. Um, you know, I think we want this like silver bullet answer, but I'm telling you guys that it can kind of exist with meat, but you know, it's not foolproof and you have to find what works for you in your journey and not just believe like every Joe Schmo out there because you don't know what they do behind scenes. You don't know what all is going on. And, you know, people have agendas, right? Like as influencers, some people get money from it and then they will skew why they're saying certain things. And I mean, right. that's the unfortunate realities of social media. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, I think what you just said is great. I think um, you just got to, you know, N equals one is the most important. And it doesn't matter what clinical studies, what influencers, what social media says. Yeah. And I think one of the other factors that comes into play too, is the fact that when somebody comes into a weight loss program, what their underlying issue is could, I mean, I mean, because for some people it may just be something that's purely physiological, you know, a, a damaged metabolism that needs to be fixed. But for others, there could be psychological baggage, behavioral baggage. I know because like one of the first diets that I tried that was low carb was actually Atkins. And one of the things that that helped me get over. And the problem is I didn't realize until further down the line that I actually had this problem and fixed it was this almost mortal fear of fear, feeling hungry. Because as somebody who was a, you know, I was never much of somebody with a sweet tooth, but you know, I could, I could tear up bread and pasta like nobody's business. And the problem is that when you're coming down off of those sorts of things, that hunger is horrible. Yeah. Um, it's, you got shakes, headaches. Uh, it's just terrible. And it's, and it creates this just like fear based eating response of like, you know, I only need to eat this much, but I don't know if I'm gonna be able to eat for, you know, another hour. So I'm better like eat, you know, twice as much as I would intend to just so I you know, make sure I don't get hungry. And, and it's, and if that kind of behavior, and I, and I see that a lot, especially in people that are coming to low carb for the first time, this, this fear of, of hunger. 
And it's one of those things where you almost have to like retrain yourself, you know, like go ahead and do low carb and sit and let that, let your, you know, your personal experience show you that hunger doesn't have to feel like, you know, death is coming. And, and I think for a lot of people, that's something that I think gets missed is that you have a lot of people who almost have this like traumatized psyche over the idea of being hungry. And, and it, once you get to that place where you're like, Hey, you know, I feel a little hungry, but I can, I can, I'm good. I'm not, I don't feel bad. I can still think straight. I think that overcoming that was, a, was something that was really big for me, but I didn't realize it at the time. It wasn't something until later when I saw other people having similar problems. I was like, Hey, I had that problem. I was terrified of being hungry. I mean, I think when we eat, you know, glucose rich foods, we go through that insulin drop and then we feel ravenous. Right. And then you have that yeah. kind of, you know, when you start a new diet and you feel hunger pains, right? Like you literally feel your stomach grumbling and you're like, I'm just going to drink a lot of water or do stuff to kind of stop eating too much so I can lose weight this time. But you know, when you eat a lot of fat and a lot of protein that you don't feel those grumblings, right? You, you can feel hungry for sure, but it's Mm -hmm. different and you don't have that anxiety of like, no, I'm on a diet. I have to white knuckle it. Right. It's um, right. Yeah. So I I completely agree with you. Um, I mean, I lived off salads and bread for such a long time. So I went through that hunger. Like I was used to being hungry and then just, uh, you know, dousing myself with diet sodas to kind of ease the hunger pains. So I, Oh yeah. And that's, that's a good point. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are scared that, you know, I maybe have to eat a little bit of meat because if I eat too much, I'm going to gain weight. And so they, you know, keep trying to ride that, hunger, um, you know, the kind of deficit of calories to then lose weight. But I mean, you don't have to really do those things. It's the mindset of a non carnivorous diet. And you don't have to be that way because you can eat sufficiently and not gain weight, but you just got to find that rhythm for you. I mean, sometimes like we talked about the, you know, we need to heal metabolic rates and we may initially gain, but you know, if you eat that the need of your body, you typically will be a weight that is quote unquote normal. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And the, I mean, one of the things too, that's amazing to me is the fact that I can just get through the day. Um, you know, I'll have a couple of cups of coffee in the morning and then I'm mostly just drinking water the rest of the day. If you told me I, I mostly drink water all day, I would have told you you were lying to me. Um, cause I was one of those people that I, I was probably single handedly keeping the Texas division of Coca-Cola's stock up with all the Coke zero that I was drinking every day. Um, but you know now drinking water That's okay. and uh, <laughs> one of the things that one of the things that i've learned too is that so much like i think a lot of people think it's, it's just about like not eating the like one of the things that bothers me i see these things saying you know x food is bad no there is no good or bad food there's there's a good and bad responses to food that are dependent on the person but I think like getting into this mindset where you're like, you know, bread is the enemy that I'm going to kind of like give the side eye to over there um, is unhelpful. Understanding that trying to do weight, lo- like, well, not just weight loss, but improving health because I mean, yeah, I had weight loss, but one of the other kind of priorities I had was trying to get my blood pressure sorted out because even with medication, it was still kind of up in a place where it didn't need to be. Is understanding that it's, that it's you know, psychological, behavioral, you got to build new habits. There's a whole bunch of different stuff. Doing carnivore and doing the challenge helped. It was kind of like, it, it helped like kind of like drafting behind a car to get, to get, you know, better gas mileage. It really made that whole process easier because the diet thing was so streamlined that it gave me more ability to focus on, on dealing with, you know, behavioral things and psychological things. Right. I think if you don't have to think too much, I mean, cause like, that's a big problem that I had when I was doing paleo. Or um, also did Whole30. Actually, Whole30 was how I figured out about the whole sweetener thing being so addictive mm-hmm. because they don't let you have sweeteners. Yeah. And, but one of the problems I found with like paleo and with Whole30 was that a lot of times you know, there's, this, there's way too much discussion tied up in is this paleo or is this Whole30? And so you've got, it's almost like watching an NFL game where people are making appeals to the booth for a ruling on the field. Hey, is this paleo? Is this whole 30? I feel really sorry for the poor people that are on the receiving end of this because they probably get more emails today they could possibly read with going, hey, is this paleo? Is this paleo? Is this paleo? Whereas whether something's carnivore or not is fairly straightforward. Sure. Yeah, I saw an email recently. So I did a whole 30. So I did a whole 30 plus carnivore. So it was just you mm-hmm. know, eating the most cleanest meats. Um, and that was why part of the reason why I also added no sweeteners to the challenge. But 
Yeah, I think recently Whole30 added peas. Um, I think it was peas and pea protein to their new diet. So now Whole30 yeah. approves. And it's funny because it makes me think of that email. But yeah, so now I think Whole30 um, allows for peas, which is funny because, you know, you would have to always pop out that list of like, okay, wait, can I eat this in the salad or, you know, whatnot. But you're right. Um, there's so much less complexity to carnivore. It's simple, right? And when it's not working for you for a few weeks, you can always change things up, whether it's the meat, the macros, or whatever it is, um, maybe the eating times, the eating windows. Right. But it's simple in general, right? And that's what makes... So if you think about like Carnivore 75 Hard, if you think about it, it's pretty simple. It's a very streamlined challenge, right? Like three gratitudes, you fast just 16 hours, um, you eat just meat, you don't add any of the frills, right? Try to eat just meals and not snacks. Just very right. simple. It seems like a lot at first, but as you do it, I'm sure you know that it's um, it becomes very just part of your day, right? And then it just um, it takes all that decision making out of food, and and then you can enjoy the other things in your life, right? Like the things that will let you thrive and enjoy life. Is there anything else you want to share with the community um, about your journey? You know, I'm so proud of you, and I can't wait to uh, um, you. see you again in person. Yeah, the. I mean, pretty much I would say just everybody needs to keep doing what they're doing, being very supportive, being very pragmatic. One of the things that I'm curious about is as carnivore gets more popular, is somebody going to figure out a way to create carnivore junk food? Because it seems like in every, in every diet movement, once it, well, that's the kind of the, one of the indicators that you've gotten traction is when people, when the, uh, what I've sarcastically referred to as the food industrial complex starts creating junk, junk food that's quote unquote compliant with, uh, whatever it is that's going on. So, you know, my recommendation is always that when you buy meats to get ones that have like almost no ingredient list. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, that's why I like carnivore snacks so much. It's just meat and salt and there's right. nothing added. Um, but, you know, a lot of the jerkies have like, they're like, we have no nitrates or other than the like, celery powder, or, you know, they add other like herbs and spices. And for people with autoimmune, that can affect them. But some people consume the pork liver that's sold in grocery stores in the packaging. Well, okay. liver doesn't last that long, but how come that does, right? There's just these things. And so I think some of it's already out there, but I think while you transition, if any kind of meat is fine, it's better. It's just, the point is to cut out sugar. Um, right. And then you can then refine because over time, I think somebody that's doing carnivore with whole meats versus, or real whole meats versus just eating processed meats will feel significantly different, right? Um, and I, I, I agree. I fear that, but I, I think it is hard to do that with the carnivore diet. Um, yeah. and, you know, like I hope that doesn't happen. Um, it's such a pure healing diet and I hope, you know, I hope the food conglomerates don't come in and try to make, um, I don't know, I don't know what they can do, but I believe that they're able to do anything. So. Yeah. I mean, because I mean, there's a fair amount of interaction I would say between carnivore and keto. And I definitely see a lot of frustration in people that are involved in keto with this just massive influx of, of, keto treats as people tend to refer to them as um i mean i mean there's obviously a few companies that do support carnivore one, one that immediately comes to mind is redmond because i mean they interact with me a lot on instagram which is funny because i don't consider myself to be that important but they're always like oh you're doing so good you're at 200 days so i really appreciate you know their social media team obviously cares about what's going on out and doing what we're doing the i would say another thing too about the community that i'd like to see too is not to be, not to like, don't keep score. Don't think that you're a better carnivore than somebody else because you eat liver and somebody doesn't, um, you know, find the stuff that you like, you know, it, it will change, you know, maybe one time you're like, Oh, I really am into chicken. And then, you know, next month it's, you're really into beef and then something else. One of the, like, one thing that I can think of was if I see interviews with people that have done long term, term carnivore, and I've seen several of those, um, you know, they're not out going out of their way to do anything kind of exotic. It's very kind of focused. And I mean, for some people, yeah, doing liver and stuff like that works great. Others, maybe not so much. But, you know, don't sit there and like try to keep score in your head saying, you know, I'm less of a carnivore because I don't eat liver. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I think so. This is where I stand with organ meat. Um, you know, from a nutritional perspective, it is very nutrient dense. So I highly recommend it. But do you need liver to survive off carnivore? You don't. Nutritionally, you could get every single nutrient. I think it ended up being you need some ribeye you need some eggs, and then I think mm -hmm. you need some butter, and that will cover all your bases for every single nutrient. So you actually don't need it. But, um, you know, there's a lot of people that want to lose weight or be at a weight that is uh, maybe, you know, not the weight that your body wants to be at. So then when you start cutting calories, 
then I'm saying the optimal way to do that is eat the most nutrient dense food. So then you right. can cut calories. So in those ways, you know, maybe liver is ideal, but you know, it's, it's a good way to get it, but is it required to do carnivore? No, like I don't even eat liver um, on a weekly basis. I try to get it out because I'm just a nutritionist, but um, right. it's not required at all. So I do periodically, but I, I've got to come up with a better way to cook it because every time, because every time I, if you're trying to fry liver, a lot of people won't like you in the house. Um, but I mean, other things too, like you can get, uh, uh, liver powder. And I've incorporated mm. that into different, different stuff. Like, you know, just mix it in with scrambled eggs and done different things like that. And that works pretty well. It adds a very interesting, a good flavor to it, actually. I mean, especially for somebody like me, it's almost kind of like almost a sweet flavor in a way. Um, oh yeah. I mean, organ meat has carbs in it. So that's, yeah. you're probably tasting a few carbs, which is kind of crazy, yeah. right? Um, yeah. yeah. You can also eat cod liver. Um, you can have like, salmon roe or even salmon. So, you know, some of the nutrients that aren't as much in like a ribeye will be in the fish. So, you know, has, yeah. as, you're, as you are incorporating fish, it's fine. I mean, I don't think Koreans ever ate liver. I don't, maybe they did and I don't know. And so my, yeah. my family background, no one's eaten it. And mm -hmm. I mean, our community has thrived, so it's fine. Um, yeah. I mean, and the thing is like, I really like, I was thinking about that because one, I mean, it's become, you know, H -E, like H-E-B grocery now is like saying, oh, you can only buy X amount of meat. And I'm like, well, how much fish can I buy? Oh, you can buy as much fish as you want. And I was like, okay, well, bring it on over. <laughs> and um, I mean, because I like fish, I like seafood, but for some odd reason, I just wasn't eating it. And I was like, well, I wonder why that is. And I couldn't really think of a reason. And so I've been eating shrimp, you know, different kinds of fish and all that stuff's good. I mean, shrimp, shrimp yeah. for breakfast is really good. Um, I and um, because, I think it's because seafood is a lot leaner. And so you don't kind of crave it, right? So when you haven't eaten for a while, and you want just your meal now you want some like fatty meat, right? And I think right. so I, I was a pescatarian. So even though I wasn't eating meat for 12 years, I still had fish. And right. so I would think I would just incorporate it. But all of a sudden, as soon as I went carnivore, I stopped eating fish. And I think it's because we don't crave it. Um, I think it's because it's a lot leaner. But I think we should incorporate it because it is good for you. It's just a variety of nutrients is good for our health. Yeah, I mean, well, like, and to the point where, like, when I cook fish, I mean, like, when I, when I did, like, I, you, I have a foreman grill, and I use that to do do tuna and I realized that this really like I, it was a little too lean I mean it, I mean nothing was wrong with it in terms of how it tasted but like when I made I made mahi mahi today I cooked I fried that in butter and that really made a big difference because it got more kind of fat in there so I mean how you prepare something is important so I would say anything that's really lean like even even like things like chicken breast make sure to add some fat back in there and that and that definitely helps um, and also make sure you salt it really good um, oh, yeah. use aggressive redmond as the term goes Yes. Yeah, so, you know, where can people find you? You know, um, your Facebook, Instagram is if there's any other social media outlet you use. Instagram handle on there is bright blur one minimum. I'm going to try to update it every day. Cause like I said, I treat it kind of like my, uh, my journal in a way of, of documenting, you know, what I'm, my exercise, what I'm eating and fasting and things like that. Um, as well as any other kind of whimsical stuff that I come across. It's amazing. Your journey is amazing. If you just go on your page, it's, uh, mm -hmm. It's amazing what little habits daily can do to change your life. Oh yeah, and I'll try, I'll try to get more pictures of myself up there. One of the problems is that I like I really need a haircut. This is just <laughs> terrible, especially for somebody like me who likes their hair short. But there, my my barber shop's opening up next week, so I'll be able to go in there and and I, I jokingly say that I'm trying to grow a mullet, but um I, I'm probably still a ways away from that. But um yeah, I'll try to like I need to I definitely need to post more kind of after stuff. I mean, cause I honestly don't have a lot of before pictures. Cause I suppose to say, I wasn't really, wasn't really thrilled to take pictures of myself at three, 300 you know, 25 pounds. But, um, and even now there's still kind of some lingering things of like, I don't want to take my picture, but you look fine. Yeah, I know, but still. Yeah, you should take it. I mean, you know, it will inspire. So all, you know, there are people that follow your journey and you're posting every day about your daily habits. Mm -hmm. And then it, it just, puts that extra punch when you share like pictures of your change, right? Your transformation. And it just, it's inspiring. It inspires other people. Like if I just do what Rob did for, well, seven months is huge, but you know, if I did it for just even 75 days, maybe I can have that change, that healing. Right. Um, and it just inspires someone else and maybe they'll never comment on your page or they'll never um, follow you, but you know, people see, I mean, cause it's, you know, in, in the public. And so I'm sure the more you share, like um, the more you'll inspire others to 
get on their journey to health. Well, thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you soon. And hopefully we'll get together soon and COVID will go away and then we'll, uh, you know, be able to eat meat and be merry. From your lips to God's ears, because I'm tired of being locked in the house. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I get it. All right. Well, take care and I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. Bye. All right, guys, you know the drill. Make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you soon. Take care.